Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. It's so good to see you here today. If you're new around here, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I'm thrilled that you are with us. We are on day seven of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We do this every single year, where what we try to do is we start the year, we try to carve out some space, create some space for God to show up in our lives. Because that's what we see in Scripture. When we create some space for God, that God will fill that space. And last week, as we jumped into our 21 days of prayer and fasting, we looked at some of Jesus' teaching on prayer and fasting, where Jesus says, when you pray and when you fast. He is inferring that it's an expectation. That is something that we should be doing, that we shouldn't neglect. It's not just for those super spiritual people. It is for everyone. And Jesus taught us this lesson. It was a powerful lesson. And he was saying, you need to be praying. You need to be fasting. And he reminded us that there was no secret posture we have to be in. Uh, there was no special key words that we use or no, no formula for a prayer. Jesus was like, just do it. Just pray. And so as we kick off this year, that's what we're doing. And so we're on day seven. We have 14 days left. And so let me just invite those of you who might have not joined us last week, a week ago. Why don't you join us for the last 14 days? Jump in with us with a season of prayer and fasting, or maybe you messed up last week, maybe you had a day or two, and you're like, oh no, I messed up, I guess I'll have to wait till next year to jump back in. No, don't wait till next year, jump back in with us and help us to finish out strong. Now, you had some homework last week, I don't know how many people did the homework, but last week I gave you an assignment. It's in our workbook. It's a simple assignment was to go home and to spend some time this week thinking about your refrigerator and cleaning your refrigerator out. And I did this last week. I, I went home during the Jags game because there was nothing on TV to watch during the Jags game. You catch my drift. And I went and I opened my refrigerator and I stepped back and I began to look on the inside at, at all the things that could get in the way, all the things that might well, tempt me, or all the things that might, might get in the way of me accomplishing what God has for me to do in these 21 days, the things that might, you know, put there that, that I might go, oh, maybe, and so I started cleaning out my refrigerator. In fact, I texted my men's group, go, hey, I'm cleaning out my refrigerator right now, and of course, they asked the question, what are you doing with the food? And I told them, I'm eating it. What do you think I'm doing with the food? It's not six o'clock yet, man. I am stuffing it in my mouth, you know? And, and, and so this project wasn't necessarily about going and cleaning out your literal refrigerator. Now, if you did that, good on you. But this refrigerator was a metaphor, a metaphor for, for our lives. And, and the question was, what are the things in our lives standing in the way between us and God? What are the things taking up space in our life that may be space that might be crowding God out or pushing God out of the place in our life where he needs to be? And man, oh man, it has been so interesting to hear what you've been saying all week long. Because I've heard from a lot of people the different things that seem, uh, seem to be taking up the primary space in our lives. Hey, here's what I heard over and over again, doom scrolling. I mean, just jumping on social media, going down the, the social media rabbit hole, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, just the hours upon hours upon hours we waste just, just following down those rabbit holes. Another thing I heard was TV. I mean, just sitting on the couch every day and just staring you know, for hours, watching football game after football game or, or on Netflix, binge watching show after show after show that so much of our life is taken up with that. Another thing I heard from people were toxic people. People in our lives that are toxic, people in our lives that are energy vampires, people in our lives that, that aren't helping us to become who God creates to be, they're people who are maybe dragging us away or dragging us down. Another thing I heard from people was, was work. The amount of hours, picking up extra shifts, all just to pursue more and more and more. And I heard so many people this week as they were wrestling through this, 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 this little project of going, man, what is it standing in the way? What is it that's pushing God out? What's edging God out of my life? What is keeping me ultimately in captivity? Because here's what we learned last week. We were not created for captivity. We were created for freedom, amen? And so on the count of three, I'm gonna make sure you're awake this morning. We're gonna say freedom on the count of three. One, two, three. Nice, not as quite, quite awake as 9.30, but you're getting there, all right? You're getting there. And, and, so, and so here's another thing I heard, and this is what I heard more than anything. Because a lot of people are talking about captivity and things that are taking up space in life. They're like, you know, it's not necessarily a cage, it's more of a, a hamster wheel. 
It's more every single morning I feel like I wake up and I just jump on this wheel and I'm just doing the, the same things over and over again. I got this busy life and so many things on my calendar, so many things I'm just trying to squeeze in there and I'm just running and running and running and I'm just running to get through the day. I'm just trying to get to the, the end of the day where I can fall into my bed and sleep for a couple hours only to wake up and to jump back on that, that hamster wheel again and just keep after it. And so many of us, if we're not careful, we find ourselves in captivity to all of this stuff and we're not making any room for God in our lives and there's no way we're going to find freedom if we don't create some space, we don't create a place for God to come and meet us and lead us out of captivity into freedom. In fact, that's what a fast is really all about. People always say, oh, a fast is about removing stuff. I go, no, a fast isn't about removing stuff. It's about adding in the right things. Because here's why I know, if you remove something, it's going to leave a gap. It's gonna leave a chasm. It's gonna leave a vacuum. And if you don't replace that space with something else, guess what? That thing you just removed is gonna to start to slide right back in there. And so what fast is all about is us replacing all this stuff in our lives with what matters most. And that's our relationship with God. It's living in the kingdom. And last week, Jesus told us two key ways for us to do that was prayer and fasting. He said, when you pray and when you fast, it's an expectation. But when Jesus was teaching about prayer, hold on a second, I can't look at the Reese's and Oreos any longer, all right? So <laughs> Keep that shut, that's tempting me, all right, here we go. So when Jesus was teaching about prayer and fasting, he wasn't talking about secrecy, he wasn't talking about those hypocrites, the hypocritos, who were, who were saying one thing and maybe doing another thing. No, when Jesus was talking about prayer and fasting, what he was trying to get to was our hearts, because he knew that there was something in our heart that if we didn't deal with it, it would keep us in captivity, and that thing in our heart is forgiveness. When we hold on to unforgiveness, and the truth is, forgiveness is the key to unlocking your freedom. You will never find freedom if you don't experience and find forgiveness. And forgiveness is like this chisel. It's like this chisel that God uses to begin to just chisel away at those bars, begin to chisel away at those chains of that stronghold in your life. Uh, forgiveness puts us in this posture where we have our hands open and where a key can be placed in our hands, a key that can unlock that door to our captivity. Who gives us that key and who is that key? It is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who sets us free because when the Son sets you free, you are truly free. And so we are all pursuing, we are all chasing after freedom. But let me just say this as we're wrapping up week one and moving into week two, because I talked to several people and they were doing this project and they were looking at their life and the things that they were doing to push God out and, and where God really was in their life. And they go, Jason, I, I felt really good going the fast, but after week one, I, I feel worse than, than I anticipated. And I always tell everybody, it's kind of like marriage counseling. You go to that very first marriage counseling appointment, you think you're good, you come out like, we're not good, all right? But you go back to the second and the third one, oh, okay, things are better. Well, this is what this is about. It's 21 days, and we're on this journey together. But let me encourage you by reminding you of the difference between two words, and the, one, the two words are this, guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Here's what guilt is. Guilt is what God sometimes uses in our life when we recognize that we've done something wrong. We've made a mistake. We've lived outside of God's best for our lives. Sometimes there's guilt. What guilt is is we recognize that we made a mistake, and we feel bad about it. Now, God, the Holy Spirit, he will use guilt in our life to help us to, to get on that right path. But there's another word, and that's the word shame. And here's why we'll assure you, God does not use shame. God never uses shame. You know who uses shame? Our enemy, our enemy whose goal is to steal and to kill and destroy your life and to keep you in a captivity. Our enemy uses shame. And here's what shame is. That failure, that mistake, your past, that becomes your identity. You begin to see yourself as that failure. You begin to see yourself as that mistake. You begin to see yourself as your past. That is shame. And so if you ever hear shame being whispered into your ears, just know that is not God speaking to you. That is the devil. That is our enemy because God never uses shame. But here's the reality, whether we recognize it or not, what, what, what shame is dealing with is our identities. What shame is dealing with is our identities. And if we're just honest with one another, we, we are a people, we are a nation, uh, we are a culture, uh, we are a country, uh, we are, are, are beings who wrestle with and struggle with our identity. Answering that age old question, who am I? To say that we are living in a season, a time of a crisis of, of identity, that is an understatement. 
I mean, there's so many identities out there. I'm, I'm young, I'm, I'm, I'm a teenager, I'm a young adult, I'm, I'm middle-aged, I'm a senior citizen, I'm single, I'm married, I'm a mom, I'm not a mom, I'm a business owner, I'm an employee, I'm unemployed, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Catholic, I'm non-denominational, I'm nothing. I mean, I'm a widow, I'm an orphan, I'm a prisoner, I'm a Jags fan, you know? I mean, we have all these different identities and all these different identities are out there. And if we're not careful, these identities can be, start to become a stronghold in our lives because we wrestle with these things. We wrestle with the different identities. We wrestle with stacking our identities on top of one another. And before we know it, we have this inner tension going on on the inside of us that is, that is leading us down a path towards captivity, not towards freedom. In fact, you, get, you know this, a couple weeks ago I turned 50 years old. I know I don't look it, thanks for saying it. Uh, but, uh, but I turned 50 a couple weeks ago and people were asking, hey, how, how do you feel? How do you feel about turning 50? And I, I was like, oh, you know, no big deal. You know, age is just a number, you know, too busy to really think about it. And I was busy, it was a Christmas season, but once everything slowed down and I started to think about it, I mean, a couple thoughts popped in my mind. I mean, are my best years behind me? I mean, I, am I gonna be able to bring value anymore because of my age? Am I gonna become invisible to the world around me? Should I just go ahead and dye my hair and buy the sports car now? I mean, I was thinking about these thoughts. And the reality is if we're not careful, the identities that we embrace, the identities that we have, the identities that we prioritize will end up becoming a stronghold in our lives. And here's the truth, we have multiple identities. Not personalities, well, some of you maybe, but identities, we have multiple identities. For example, I'm a son. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a dad, I'm a friend, I'm a pastor, I'm a former athlete, I'm adopted, I'm Scottish, I'm a sinner, I'm a child of God. I mean, we have multiple different identities, and the problem isn't that we have multiple different identities. Here's where the captivity sets in. The captivity begins to set in when we take these identities that should be down here, and we place them up here, and we put them over our primary identity. We take things like our gender, or our, our professional status, our, our race, our nationality, our political leanings, our, 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 our sexuality, our theological uh, whatever uh, beliefs. We take those things and we place them over our primary identity. You say, well, pastor, what is our primary identity? I'll tell you what it is. You, me, we, we are a child of God. We are a child of God. In fact, on the count of three, let's just declare that together. Let's declare our primary identity together. I am a child of God on the count of three. One, two, three. I am a child of God. Yes, you are. But here's the struggle and here's the challenge. So many times in life, all these different identities that we embrace in our life, what happens and why the captivity sets in is we begin to take those and we put them over our primary identity and we push that primary identity, that child of God, further and further down. And those other identities begin to direct our lives. And so I wanna take you to a, uh, an identity crisis I found in the Bible. It's a really unique story. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're gonna be in the book of Exodus today, the book of Exodus. And, and, and this is an incredible story. It's a unique story. Uh, the book of Exodus is the second book in the Bible. The second book, it's after Genesis. We've been living in Genesis for over a year. We'll go back there in two weeks to finish it up. But the book of Genesis is one, Exodus is number two. And we're gonna be in chapters four and five and six. And so we're gonna take you there in just a minute. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a guy who you would never expect, never expect, that was wrestling with his identity that he was having a crisis of identity in his life. Now, the story of Exodus that we see in the book of Exodus, it's a story of God's people being in captivity and God lead the, leading them out of captivity into freedom. But in order for God to lead them out of captivity into freedom, he needed somebody to go and be their leader. And so God finds a young man, actually, he's not a young man at this point, he finds a man by the name of Moses. Say Moses. And so I'm gonna take you to a very unique text, Exodus chapter four, verses 24. And I'm gonna read this to you and you're gonna go, where is he going with this? And you're gonna wonder, but I'm gonna take you on a journey today and point something out to you that maybe you've never seen before in the Bible. I think will maybe give us all a little bit of hope when it comes to figuring out who we truly are. And so let me read our text to us. This is our key text, Exodus four, verse 24. It says this, it says, on the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night. 
The Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And when she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now you're going, where in the world is he going with this? What does this have to do with identity? Well, here's why I love the Bible. The Bible opens up so many questions. So many times there are more questions than answers. And listen, if you have questions about the Bible, that's good. I promise you, the Bible can handle your questions. And so this text asks several key questions. Number one, why is God about to kill Moses? I mean, what, I thought he just chose him. I thought he just said, I'm sending you. So, so what's that about? How did Zipporah, his wife, know immediately what to do that would keep God from killing Moses? Third question to ask, why is his son not already circumcised? And, and so the text is, is causing us to, to look in a little bit deeper and ask a few key questions. And what I think is going on here is an identity crisis. And, and so let me take you back and let me just give you a quick picture of Moses' life. Moses was born a Hebrew. He was born to two Hebrew parents, so he was a Hebrew baby. He was born in the land of Egypt. He was there because of Joseph, we're gonna get there shortly, brought his family into Egypt, and they've been living there for several hundred years, but their numbers had grown and grown and grown. And so here is this, this Hebrew baby born to Hebrew parents, born in, in, in basically in captivity here in Egypt. And what we're going to see is that the numbers of the Hebrew people grew and grew and grew to the point where Pharaoh was concerned. And so Pharaoh had a plan, genocide. Genocide, let's go ahead and kill a whole generation of Jews. Let's go and kill a whole generation of these Hebrew people. And that will thin out their ranks, that will thin their numbers so that they can be controlled. And so here is this Hebrew family with this Hebrew baby. As we see according to the text, he's about three months old. Now, an important point of fact, every Hebrew is circumcised on the eighth day. And so this is all going down a couple months into young Moses' life. And so his mother takes him because of this genocide, because all the babies are gonna be killed, takes him and he puts him in a basket. And we know this story if we watch, you know, the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt. And they, and they take Moses, and they put him in the basket and, and she floats him in the Nile and, and she hopes that, hopes that somebody will see him. Somebody will take him. And we see that somebody does that this little baby in this basket gets trapped in some reeds there in the Nile and happens to be really close near to Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter sees this, this, this little basket, opens it up and immediately sees and recognizes that there's a Hebrew baby boy. Now, how in the world does she know that there's a Hebrew baby boy, that this is a Hebrew baby boy? Now, this is where Hollywood messes things up. And again, sometimes we get our, our theology through Hollywood Never right, hardly ever right. You see, in the Ten Commandments, they, they have Moses wrapped in a blanket. And they go, oh, it's a Hebrew blanket. That's how we know he's a Hebrew baby. That's not how they knew he was a Hebrew baby, all right? He was a baby boy who had been circumcised. When she opens up and sees this baby boy, she goes, oh, it's a Hebrew baby boy. She recognizes immediately. And so she brings this baby into her house, the house of Pharaoh. And so Moses isn't raised as a Hebrew. He's raised as an Egyptian. And not just any Egyptian, he is raised in the number one house on the planet, the most influential house, the most wealthy house on the planet. He's raised with the best of everything. The best clothes, the best food, the best training, the best education, he has got the best. But you have to imagine the older and older Moses grew, the more he began to understand what was going on around him, the more this, this anxiety, the more this, this internal angst began to rise up because he was watching his people. He was watching his Hebrew people being treated poorly. He was watching them as captives. He was seeing them be, being oppressed. And more than likely, he may have had even servants serving him that were Hebrew people. And so he's got this tension going on inside of him because here he is born a Hebrew child, but now he's being raised as an, an Egyptian and he sees his people, the Hebrew people and their plight. And this guy probably has a little survivor's guilt. Think about it. He's the only one that survived the genocide. Everyone else was dead. All the other babies were dead, but not this one. And he's not just living. He is living in the lap of luxury. And so to think about this guy, to think about Moses and, and this, 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 this crisis of identity going on in his life, 
I mean, here he was born a Hebrew, but he's not being raised as a Hebrew. And here he is being raised as, a, as an Egyptian, but he's not an Egyptian. And so there was this anxiety, there was this tension in his life with this, with this, this identity crisis that he was feeling. And what we see is the story continues that Moses has the heart of God, a heart of compassion. And he sees the, the condition of the Hebrew people and he has uh, compassion on them. He sees how they're being oppressed, just like God sees it. And he wants to step in and he wants to do something about it. And we see one day that there was this Egyptian slave driver and he was abusing two Hebrew slaves. And so Moses does step in, he does something about it and he loses his cool and he kills he murders that Egyptian. He takes his body and he hides it in the sand somewhere and he goes about his life. But a couple days later, later the Bible records the two Hebrew uh, servants, they were fighting back and forth and, and Moses goes and tries to, to make peace with these two guys and he tries to intervene and they look who it is and they go, oh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna kill us like you did that Egyptian? And at that moment, Moses was a man without a home. He wasn't a Hebrew. And now he can't be an Egyptian. And so Moses runs. He runs into the desert. He runs into the wilderness. He runs away from this crisis in his life. And he gets in the wilderness. He meets a man named Jethro who is a, a shepherd. And Moses begins 40 years of being a shepherd in the wilderness. And Jethro has a daughter by the name of Zipporah. Moses marries her. And he spends the next 40 years of his life running away from his past running away from his former identity of, of, of this Hebrew baby, of this, of this Egyptian guy raised in, the, in Pharaoh's house. He's running away. And so for 40 years, he thinks he's put it behind him. He thinks it's all behind him. And all of a sudden, God shows up. Now know this about Moses. Moses didn't have a Bible. He didn't have all these stories to read about, about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, Moses is the one who wrote these stories down. Uh, many Bible scholars believe. Um, he wasn't raised Hebrew, so he wasn't taught these stories. And so he doesn't know any of this. And all of a sudden, this God shows up. And this God says, hey, Moses, I'm choosing you. And I'm sending you back to Egypt. I'm sending you back with a mission because I've seen the condition. I've seen the oppression. I've heard the cries of my people and I want you to go back and I want you to set my people free. And Moses famously at this moment, at this burning bush moment, he begins to object to God. I'm like, hey God, I think you got the wrong guy. I mean, I'm really not the guy you're looking for. Uh, he might be down the road in another pasture with some other sheep. It's not me. I, I'm not, find somebody else. I don't even know who you are. I mean, I don't even know what your name is. I mean, what Moses is doing here is, I think what Moses is doing, he's trying to stall. He's just trying to, you know how your kids at night when you try to put them to bed, how they try to stall all the time? Hey, hey can, can mom, mom, dad, can I have a glass of water? Can, can you read me a story? Hey, you know, I forgot something downstairs. Can I go get it? Hey, would you tell me about that time when, you know, and they're just stalling and stalling and stalling. And I think here in this story, what we see is, is Moses is stalling. He's trying to look for this right answer. He's trying to have an answer to come back to this God who showed up and said, hey, I want you to be the guy who goes. And so Moses is given excuse after excuse after excuse. And he ends up saying something really interesting. And so let me show you this, Exodus chapter four, verse 10. Here's what Moses says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. And not now, even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. On the count of three, say tongue-tied. One, two, three. All right, all right. So, so a lot of us have grown up believing, a lot of us have been taught that, that Moses might have had a stuttering problem that Moses maybe had some sort of a speech impediment. And candidly, I think that's lazy. I think that's maybe just an assumption because here's what I know about Moses. Moses was raised in the number one household on the planet. He had more resources at his fingertips. He had the best training and education. And if he had a stuttering problem or a speech impediment, don't you think they would have trained that out of him as a kid? And so I think it's kind of lazy for us to see. It's an assumption for us to say, well, he just had a speech impediment. You see, I think there's a lot going on here. I think there's so much more going on in here. And so Moses got a bunch of excuses and he gives these excuses to God one after another. Finally, God has had enough. Says, so you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send your brother Aaron. You can partner up with him. I'm tired of talking about it, Moses. You're the guy. Now go, I'll meet you in Egypt. And so after that moment at the burning bush, after this conversation that Moses has with God, that's where our key text comes in. 
And I'll read it to you again, verse 24. On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife Zipporah took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, yuck. That's not what he said, I don't know. But I would say that. But it says, now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And when she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. And man, oh man, have we not talked about this a lot through Genesis? This mark, this covenant, for this identity of the people of God, this circumcision. It says, after that, the Lord left him alone. And so I know you're thinking, where is he going with this? Well, here is where I'm going. So here's the question I wanna ask. Why is Moses' son not circumcised? Well, why is he not circumcised? Well, I think it's an identity crisis. Because if he was circumcised, what Moses would be saying by circumcising his son is, I identify, my uh, identification of me is I am a Hebrew. And because I'm a Hebrew, I want my son and all my descendants to be Hebrews too, so I'm gonna continue this mark of circumcision to make sure that they always are because this is the mark of the covenant, the blood covenant between God and Abraham. But that's not what we see here. Moses' son is not circumcised. And so it's Moses basically saying, I don't see myself as a part of God's people. And so he's wrestling through a very real identity crisis. We need a little more evidence? Well, flip next chapter, chapter five. We go to chapter five and we see God leading him to Egypt. He sends him to, to Pharaoh, have a conversation with Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh uh, to let his people go. And Pharaoh laughs, says, no, not gonna have it. In fact, your people, uh, they're, they're, they're nothing but a bunch of whiners and complainers. And so because you came and made this request to me, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm going to, to double your workload. You're gonna go and you're gonna make more bricks. That's what you're gonna do. And so Moses leaves this and he's like, okay, God, this didn't work out very well. And so on his way out, he's complaining to God about what just happened. And listen to what he says. He says, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people. And you have done nothing to rescue them. And so whose people are these? Are they Moses' people? No. Are, are they our people, God and, and Moses? Are they our people? No, he said, no, these are your people. And so he says, and God, God, you sent me to do this. Help a brother out, nothing's working out like you said it was gonna happen here. We're failing here. And listen to God's reply to Moses. He said, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. And when he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. God's like, I got this. Hey, Moses, don't worry about it. I just need you to trust me. I've got this. And God continues, he says, and God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord that appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. And, and this is a beautiful moment here because what he's saying is, you know, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I showed up, but I was not super personal. But man, I'm showing up now. I see, the, I see my people. I hear their cries. I see their oppression. I have a heart of compassion. So I'm showing up and I'm telling them my name. It's a beautiful moment. And so Moses hears this. He's like, man, I gotta go tell all the, the leaders, the Hebrew elders. And so he goes back to tell the Hebrew elders. It says, so Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said but they refuse to listen anymore. They become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. So God sends them to the elders, says to the elders, man, this is God's name. They're like, you know what? We don't care what his name is. All you've done is made our life miserable. All you made is, is made is made our life more difficult. So, so just get out of here. Then God says, hey, go back, to, go back to Pharaoh. You go back a second time. And, and Moses is like, no one's listened to me, God. I mean, these people, these Hebrew people, they're not listening to me. You think Pharaoh's gonna listen to me? And listen to what he says. Verse 12 of chapter six, really interesting words. Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. So how then shall Pharaoh listen to me, for I am of uncircumcised 
lips. Now, I'm no medical professional, but I know you don't do that to lips. And so what in the world is this text saying? What in the world does it mean to, to have uncircumcised lips? And listen, translators throughout the generations have struggled with this phrase and what Moses was saying here. But I think this goes back to this whole identity crisis because this, this idea, this picture of circumcision was a picture of identity. It was who you belong to. That you belong to the family of God. And so he doesn't just say it once, but listen, he says it again a couple of verses later. It says, on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the, lands, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? I'm a man without a home. I'm a man who doesn't belong. I was born a Hebrew, but I wasn't raised a Hebrew. I, I was raised as an Egyptian, but I'm not an Egyptian. I have uncircumcised lips. I do not belong. And what I love, if you look in your Bible right now, between those two points of scripture, when Moses says those two words two times, you know what sits between the text? A genealogy. A genealogy. Whose genealogy? Moses's. It's as if God put it there to say, you know what, Moses? I wanna remind you. I wanna remind you where you come from. I wanna remind you who you are, that yes, you are the man I say you are. You are the person I am choosing and you are the right person to go. I mean, this is amazing what God is doing here for Moses as Moses has been wrestling through this 80 year identity crisis. I mean, this whole story, the whole beginning part of, of Exodus is this massive identity crisis that God is trying to lead Moses and through Moses, his people out of. And listen, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of relate to this. I don't know if you've ever wrestled through an identity crisis. I don't know if you ever wrestled through any of that. I know I have. I'll never forget being 14 years old and hearing a judge drop his gavel down. And once that gavel dropped down, I had a new father and I had a new name. I was adopted by a stepdad. And while it was a phenomenal day, it was a great day in my life, it also was a very sad day. A sad day to, to recognize and realize that I also had a father who didn't want me. And it put me on this path for nearly 40 years of my life, wrestling through, where do I belong? Well, what, what is my true name? Am I good enough? Am I ever gonna measure up? And, and everything am I doing, am I doing everything to just get approval so that people will accept me for who I am? And I gotta imagine, that's where Moses is. So much of his life just wrestling through, where do I belong? Who am I? Am I Hebrew? Am I Egyptian? Am I nothing? Do I, am I ever gonna measure up? Am I ever gonna be good enough? Why in the world did God come to ask me to do these things? And when I look at Moses' life, there was nobody better prepared and better qualified to go and do what God called him to do than Moses. He was born a Hebrew, raised an Egyptian, had the best education and training that money could buy. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh. He knew Pharaoh and the family, and he knew the government. There was no one better qualified to go and set God's people free than Moses. But God had to set Moses free first because Moses, for 80 years, had been living in the captivity of this identity crisis. And I love how God works I love how God doesn't show up and go logically through, hey Moses, let me just show you here, all right? This is logically why you are the right guy for this. He doesn't do this. I mean, Moses has some insecurities. Moses is wrestling through, through, through his qualifications and God doesn't just show up and give him a, a list of things. God just meets him where he's at. He meets him right in the middle of his insecurities. He meets him right in this identity crisis and he loves on Moses. See, here's what I know. God is not interested in your qualifications. God is interested in your availability. God is interested in your trust. And maybe like Moses, maybe like me, you're wrestling with your identity. Maybe you're wrestling with me. Am I ever gonna measure up? Am I ever gonna belong? Am I ever gonna be good enough? And maybe you're wrestling with that and you're wrestling with your qualifications and you're taking your qualifications and you're, you're measuring them up against somebody else. You go, but look at them or, and look at them, but look at my qualifications. God is not concerned. He's not interested in your qualifications. What he wants is your heart. He wants your availability. He wants you to trust him. And I love this about the story of Moses, how God just shows up in Moses' life and just gently and loving him leads him out of this captivity for 80 years. He leads him towards answering the most 
important question that we could ever answer in life. Not who am I, but whose am I? God led Moses to answer the question, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And then he leads Moses on this, this journey to start to develop these, these values in his life that are gonna continue to point him back to the fact that yes, he is a child of God. And throughout his life and throughout his leadership of God's people, that, that identity of a child of God, those values that God establishes in his life, help him to be the man of God that we celebrate, that we make movies about. Because he's crystal clear on his identity, whose he is and who he is. So let me ask you a question. Have you answered that question for yourself? Whose am I? Have you answered that question that yes, I am a child of God? Or maybe you're wrestling with your identity. Maybe you're wrestling with, with do you belong? Are you good enough? And hear the words of God saying, yes, you are a child of God. You've been made in my image. Or maybe what you're wrestling with is these other identities that we have in life, these lesser than identities, these identities that we're down here, maybe those identities have risen to the top and that identity as a child of God has been pushed to the bottom. And maybe you're drifting. Maybe you're confused. Maybe it's time to pull that identity uh, all the way to the top. I am a child of God to get clarity in your life and to establish the values, the values in your life that will help you stay and not forget that yes, yes, you are a child of God. In fact, here's our takeaway this week and here's our challenge this week and here's our project this week. If it's in your workbooks, it's on page uh, 46 and 47 of our workbooks this week. And if you don't have a workbook, I think we might still have a few left. If not, you can jump online and grab a digital version on our app or on our website. And, and here's the challenge this week. What values, what values do you have in your life that guide your life every single day? I wanna challenge you this week to spend some time in prayer, asking God for clarity, asking the Holy Spirit to point you to four key values that drive your life. I mean, for me, I'm gonna give you mine just kind of as an example, and I'll post these online later just to give you an example for, for, for you as you're working through that this week. Here are my four values. Kingdom, grace, wisdom, and service. Kingdom, grace, wisdom, and service. And then I wanna challenge you to find verses, some scriptures that just reinforce that for you. So that as you're going throughout your day, you're going throughout your life, you have decisions in front of you, that you can put some, some scripture to these words that give a value to you, that will continue to point you in the right direction. And, and so you, uh, on page 47, you'll see there's a, a little compass, a little activity that you can do there. And you can write them in and there's space there for you to write your, your scriptures in along with it to create your compass for your life, to help guide you where, where, as you go through life, to make sure you're going the right direction. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more next week. But then here's the follow-up project, to write a vision statement for your life to take those values and to write a vision statement for your life. And I'm gonna give you mine as an example. Here's my vision statement. I am a child of God who boldly lives as a kingdom man, extends grace, pursues wisdom, and serves others. That is my personal mission statement. And so I wanna challenge you this week to do that activity, page 46 and 47. And, and you know what, dads, I wanna challenge you a little bit further. Dads, I wanna challenge you to a, another level. Maybe do that for your family. Take some time this week. We have some directions about how you can do it to your family. But dads, guys, here's what I know. We go to work all the time and we put together plans. I mean, we hire consultants to come in and we spend time putting together mission statements and vision statements and we put together you know, business proposals and we, we spend all this time working to build business and to make sales. But how much time do we do that for our own families? And so dads, husbands, let me challenge us this week to do that to do that in your marriage, to do that with your family, to make sure you guys know whose you are and who you are. Because here's why I know, the clearer your values become, the clearer your identity will be. And the clearer your identity becomes, the freer your life will be. And that's what we're all after, freedom. You are not captives, you've not been created for captivity, you've been created to live free lives. And speaking of freedom, it's the cross. The cross ultimately gives us that ultimate freedom. And so I want us to move right now into this moment of communion. So I wanna ask everyone who's here in person to take out the little packet. If you're watching online, I'd love for you to go and, and take just a couple of moments to get what you're gonna use for communion. 
And as you're doing that, let me just read a few verses to you to just encourage you as we go in this moment. John writes these words, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. A little later, John writes, see how very much our Father loves us? For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Paul wrote to a church in Rome, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirits to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. So as we come to this moment of communion, as we think about the cross, we know that every time they drove that hammer on that nail, it was a reminder that we have a new father and that we have a new name. We have a father who'll never leave us, never abandon us, who is for us and wants us to trust him. And we have a new name. We are children, we are heirs of the kingdom of God. Jesus made that possible. And so as we move into this moment of communion, let's bow our heads, let's fold our hands, let's go into the posture of prayer as we embrace the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this 21 days of prayer and fasting, creating some space for you. And your promise to us is if we create it, you'll show up. And so this week, I just ask that you will continue to set the captives free that you'll help us to go and spend some time, honestly, just wrestling through our identity issues, our identity problems, our struggles in our life around identity, and that we'll affirm and that we will fix our identity as a child of God. And we'll place that where it belongs, number one in our lives. Help us to remember that we are not slaves, but we are your children. Thank you for the cross, Jesus that ultimate act of freedom for us. We couldn't find it on our own. There's nothing we could do to, to pay our way or to earn our way or to work our way to that freedom. Jesus, it was given to us by you. The sun sets us free. We are free indeed. And Jesus, you set us free on the cross. And so we come to you in this moment of communion. And right now we take this piece of bread and we eat this to remember your body that you laid on the cross for us. Let's remember Jesus. And Jesus, in the same way, we drink from this cup, this juice, to remember the blood that you poured out for us to wash our sins away. As we drink this, Jesus, we remember. Jesus, help us to never accept captivity. We weren't created to be captives. We were created to live free lives. And so would you work in us this week as we continue, as we begin day eight later tonight, as we roll into this second week of this fast, would you rest, help us wrestle to ground our identity issues? Would you help us to hold on to the truth that we are all children of God? We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much less of us and more of you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.